There's been a discovery. It was announced yesterday that indicates there's potentially new physics that we we don't know of. <laughs> I know it's a big statement. Fermi Lab in Illinois is where this experiment was done. Have you ever heard of um, the standard model? Any? Have you ever seen anything that looks yeah. like this? Yeah. yeah. This is basically all the particles that we know of and all the forces that we know of, electrons, protons, everything that make up our atoms. There's evidence from this experiment that there's maybe something beyond that. This is huge because the standard model has been like a work of decades. It comes from theory and experimentation and one of the last particles that we, that we had theorized from the standard model and then discovered was the Higgs boson, which was that massive experiment at CERN. So for there to not even be theorized particles, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's not even in our theory. It's just evidence that there's something beyond our theory, beyond our theory and beyond an, uh, anything we've ever seen. Okay. So that is what this announcement means or potentially means. So I say potentially because what the experiment was that was just announced, it's not precise enough for it to be considered a big scientific announcement. Okay, so what it is, is very complicated. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a muon? No, great, okay. <laughs> uh, but you've heard of electrons. They're in these terrible models of atoms. There are other particles that are not as common. There are actually a lot of them. For example, the Higgs boson. Another example is neutrinos. And then another example is the muon. And the muon is, oh, the muon was discovered in 1936 because they were looking at the way that electrons move in a magnetic field. And then they see another particle come through and it has a much wider arc. And they're like, what the heck is that? So have you ever heard that uh, if you've got just a uniform magnetic field and you shoot a charged particle through it, it'll curve? Have you heard of this? Okay, does it make sense? Okay, good. I'm glad I asked. What is another example of this happening? Oh, in CERN, the reason that particles go around and around is because they're charged particles and they're going around in these big magnetic fields and it makes them curve. And then when they collide and all this stuff comes off, they're watching how they curve in a magnetic field. That's why you see all these spiral lines coming off of the collision because if a po particle has a negative or a positive charge, it'll curve one way or the other way in a magnetic field. If it doesn't have a charge at all, like a neutron, it just goes straight. So you'll see those spirals and then you'll see the straight lines. So there's these guys and then they see another particle come through and it has a much wider arc. Much wider means that it has more mass. So they found this particle, they're like, what is that? Turns out it is just like the electrons. A lot of people call it the cousin to the electron, but it has 207 times the mass. Oh, so that's what just, they discovered. They discovered the muon. If you had a bunch of muons instead of electrons in your atoms, you would be way heavier. I don't know how much heavier. Um, okay, so the measurement that was just made was that, oh, this is the part where it's gonna get really tricky. You know how a top that's spinning will kind of wobble around? If the top were in space, it wouldn't do that. It would just spin, it wouldn't wobble. The reason that it's wobbling is because it's spinning in a gravitational field and gravity is having an effect on the top and making it wobble. Can you accept that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm good, because I don't wanna go in. Similarly, there's another really complicated property of particles called spin. It's not like the particle is actually spinning, it's just a property. But when you put a particle with magne magnetic spin in a magnetic field, it'll wobble in a similar way. The amount that it would wobble is something that we can predict. Say that the amount of wobble is supposed to be two. The amount of the amount it's supposed to wobble is called the G factor, and the theoretical number is supposed to be two for the muon. Now there's something else weird that we've theorized, which is that the wobble should also be affected by <laughs> something that people call quantum foam. Have you heard of the idea that there are constantly particles popping in and out of existence in the vacuum of space? Yeah, okay, so those particles popping in and out, when that happens, they can interact with a particle, a, a real particle that exists like a muon, and then they can affect that wobble. I know that this is getting to the point where it's like, okay, what is the point of all of this? We've got quantum foam affecting the wobble, but we're almost there. And we have a number for that, and it's like, it's close to the two. It's like 2.00, and then there's this added correction. 233183620. And the 86 in parentheses for the error. Now, that's obviously a very precise theoretical measurement. 12 digits of precision that we think we know the theoretical amount of the effect of the wobble from the quantum foam. They did a, a measurement of the G factor, of the amount of wobble. 
and they saw it didn't match the theoretical number. So it didn't match it by um, in the last four digits of that 11 digit, you saw instead of 3620, you saw 4122. So does this already mean that the foam is not causing it? No, it doesn't mean that the foam is not causing it. It means that it means that there's probably particles that we don't know of or forces we don't know of because we have such a precise idea of what how the wobble should change based off of known particles and how we know they pop up into existence. So if we measure something different, most likely it must be that the physics is different. So you brought us in here to tell us after all this that there's more we don't know. <laughs> The newest discovery in physics. We might know less than we thought. But it's it's the way that we don't know more that's in, that's important. It's it's not like oh we don't know what happened before the Big Bang. It's like no, we're seeing evidence for something specific to go look for. Right here's the moment when physicists are like oh my god, let's go look for new particles. Let's go look for new forces. Okay, maybe it's not that important to you to go look for new particles, but have you seen CERN? It's huge. Like that entire experiment was looking for one new particle. Uh, what are they gonna do to look for us? I know, I know. Like there's nothing specific to look for yet because it doesn't fit our theories. Like when we looked for the Higgs boson, it was part of the standard model theory. Yeah, it was like, there's the Higgs right there. Here's a grayed out box of a particle we have a theory for and then we discovered it and like, boop, fill that in with the color. But we're seeing an anomaly. We're seeing something act differently than we ever predicted before. It's like winning at bingo and then someone's like, look, a new alphabet. Or it's like winning at bingo and then you get another bingo card. Bingo plus. You know? That's pretty crazy. It doesn't fit the standard model. I know. So it could be new particles, new forces, or something wrong about our current theory. But we know so much about our current theory and so many of our very expensive, very precise experiments have verified what we know. So for the, the idea that some of it to be wrong is almost as inconceivable as for there to be new particles and new theories, which is also inconceivable at this point. But yeah, it's exciting. How come they're confident there's something something really big to find? Why, why can't it just be something they haven't thought of? Like anything magnetic on Earth? where we are placed in the galaxy. So one reason that they're confident about this result is that it was done before in 2001. So it was originally done in Brookhaven National Labs in 2001, and it was such a big result at the time that they're like, we have to verify this. And so they took the big old magnet, a big superconducting magnet, 50 foot in diameter. Here it is. See that red thing? That's the magnet arriving at Fermilab to a big party and a big celebration because it was transported 3,200 miles to upgrade it. I went to Fermilab in 2016 and the only picture I took besides like, oh, this is a pretty view down the building was of this diagram that shows the path that the magnet took. Okay, so this is not this is not technically a discovery yet. And the reason I said that is because you need a certain amount of certainty. <laughs> You need a certain certainty to consider a scientific announcement as, as like an actual discovery. And you need it to, um, to be something called five sigma, which is just like a statistical amount. The exciting thing is that they verified a result from 2001. But again, normally and rightfully, five sigma is the amount of certainty that you usually need to make this, to make this type of announcement. So since they're only at 4.2 sigma, Scientists are being careful and saying like, yes, this is exciting. We verified a result from a previous experiment. So that's promising, but it's not promising enough because we don't have enough certainty. Oh, they're gonna keep it here and they're gonna upgrade the experiment for future runs um, and get, get more precision. The chance that this, this measurement is a random fluctuation, like a random statistical error in the, in the measurement is one in 40,000. Like not enough that I would bet my life on, but uh, and physics is usually so small or so big that that's like weirdly a normal number. It's usually talking about like the billions or the quantum. Right, <laughs> so right, right, right. We know enough of that to make a good enough prediction of what the what the change in this little wobble, the G factor, should be, and and we see something different. That's it. Big announcement. Yay, okay, and cut. 
So actually when I was doing my experiment looking for dark matter in college, when we first turned it on, one of the first things we saw was a muon. PI, the person running the experiment, was like, oh, see that blip, that signal, that's a muon. We just detected these cosmic ray muons, which are these particles raining down. Device, and what does it use to detect muons? We were making a detector that was looking for actually neutrons. All these are just different particles. And the device was like this, <laughs> I'm making it this big, but it's actually like, I don't know, what's here to here, like 10 feet? I'm in this big chamber full of this fluid called scintillator. And it's a really cool fluid because if you just like barely look in there, you see a little glow. So a particle will come through this scintillator and they'll cause it to glow along the path. Um, and then we had detectors on either end that would capture the light. And so you'd see, oh, a particle came through because we got a little bit of blip of light, which meant that something came through our scintillator. That's how the detector worked. Okay. So we turned it on and we were like, we got a little flash of light. That's probably a muon. We just saw a cosmic ray muon. Any more questions? Okay. The other really cool thing that muons were used for was to verify one of the predictions of special relativity from Einstein, specifically time dilation. And this was a long time ago, 1941. Have you heard of time dilation? The basic idea is that if we were moving really fast, like if I was jetting through the universe, then time would tick slower for me, which is cool. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot more to it. Uh, basically time ticks differently depending on whether you're moving or not. If you went and traveled around the, the earth a bunch of times in a really fast rocket ship and came back, you would have aged less than I would have aged. That was a prediction of relativity, but not verified until later. And one of the, the verifications was this really cool experiment. The thing about muons is that they, they don't live very long. They have a mean lifetime of 2.2 microseconds. But there are a lot of them constantly raining down on us because a lot of them are produced when cosmic rays come from the universe and they hit our atmosphere. Imagine you can measure how many muons there are, like go up on top of a hill and measure how many are coming through a little area and then go down to the bottom of the mountain and you know how fast these muons are supposed to decay. So you should go to the bottom and you should only see a certain number because the rest of them should have decayed. But what happened is they saw more at the bottom than they should have. More were surviving. But what that means is that because these muons are going so fast, time is ticking slower for them. They're actually not decaying because they haven't reached that mean lifetime. So that was a verification of this idea of relativity. Does that make sense? I wrote it down. <laughs>